many thanks for the people who are stay here before the lunch. So I have the, the chance to launch the, the poster presentation event. So all the participants and all the, the people who have to, to present the poster, please come here and co join me on, on, the, on the stage. We will take a, a picture. So this is for me uh, uh, one of the very important points of, uh, of this week. Uh, we speak a lot of uh, international uh, way of working, collaboration, uh, user-centric approach, and, uh, and this, um, this way to, to highlight some uh, ideas, some innovations, some, uh, some uh, scientific discoveries is very important. Is, uh, uh, the result of user job and they want to propose and they want to be highlight as user of HPC. So please finish to, to join us. Normally there are 20 presentations. So take care to yeah to be more grouped, please. <laughs> no, it's important. This is the energy and the, the user energy we need in a such week. Okay. Okay, so we will start. Uh, are you aware of the, yeah, who have to start and then the, no? Oh, so join and, and I will call you. So the first is uh, Robert Badjak. Yeah, so you will be the first. And me, I will be the scheduler. So two minutes for you. It's very short. And then what I propose to the other, you can go upstairs. And then, step by step, I will, uh, I will call you. And uh, we'll try to, to go as fast as possible. Many thanks. Yep. Okay, hello, so I guess I can start. So my name is Robert Babiak, I'm a PhD student at Technical Lisbon, and I work under the supervision of Dr. Maria Vranic uh, on acceleration of particles using high power lasers. This is important because currently conventional accelerators, they need very long distances to accelerate particles. For example, at CERN, they need several kilometers. But the uh, thing is that, uh, Plasma-based accelerators have potential to achieve those energies on much shorter distances. So instead of many kilometers, we can do the acceleration on few meters. But to study this, we strongly rely on numerical simulations that are very demanding, and namely we use an algorithm called particle in cell. Uh, the particle cell algorithm has two main components: its electromagnetic fields and its charged particles. So Electromagnetic fields, they are placed on the mesh, and they define the motion of particles, whilst the particles can move freely in a space, but they also influence the, how electromagnetic field develops in time and space. So in our simulations, we have fields influencing particles and particles influencing electromagnetic fields. And this can be put together uh, correctly so it results in numerically stable algorithm that can very precisely describe phenomena present in laser plasma physics and in plasma physics in general. So one of the most important features of this algorithm is that it can very precisely predict results of experiments, which is very useful for experimentalists to set up their uh, experiments and tweak the parameters they need. So 
hopefully with using uh, theoretical models that we de develop numerical simulations and, ex and experiments, you'll be able to get to the accelerators that will be much more accessible for uh, science, medicine, and for example, cancer therapy and so on. So thank you. Many thanks. So you were the first, it's the most complex. And you, for all you could, I think uh, after, Perhaps people will be at the poster if you have questions or you can join in them perhaps this afternoon or I don't know. Normally there are not a question plan. So Martin Suprowski. Uh, hello, I'm here instead of Martin Surkowski because he is sick. Uh, so uh, I only present the poster. The poster is about advanced traffic modeling for smart cities. And uh, he want to model uh, the traffic not for particle individual, but for the whole city in order to improve uh, the number of cars that can go through the large city and so on. Uh, he use uh, big data analysis uh, that is provided by Everest project. And uh, he provides, uh, he provide the what if analysis what if we close the uh, bridge, we, what if we close the road, what will happen, how the traffic change, and so on. Uh, he provides traffic prediction. It means uh, the prediction, what will be traffic in the future in a particular uh, crossroad, and, and so on. And uh, he provides intelligent uh, routing. He are able to provide uh, optimization for uh, whole traffic in, in the city, in, instead of particle individual. More information can be found uh, on the poster. Thank you. So many thanks. Very short. So next, Ludovico Niata. So, good morning, everyone. Um, Data-driven methods are definitely changing the develop a new modeling in a different way where there is a growing interest on developing subfilter scale modeling for uh, larger dissimulation. So unfortunately, those techniques are not mature enough, and we need to understand and to need to fine tune those models. And we believe that distributed training, it's, it's, it's uh, perfect to, uh, that's not my, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so we believe that then distributed tra uh, training, it's, it's definitely important. So, however, uh, those, those uh, data sets that we're using are pretty different from image processing because they contain, uh, for example, very large sample, they have three destruction and so on. So we need to understand how to scale up those, those kind of um, applications for future development. In this work, we design a, a, a generative adversarial network which takes into account low resolution at the input and, and basically want to super solve up to the DNS level in order to compute high order statistics. Uh, we also develop a kind of a physically inspired loss in order to drive, uh, to drive our, our optimization. So typical data, data uh, parallelism approach, uh, as I've shown there, scale up the batch size as a function of GPUs in order to keep the, the batch size constant per GPU. So what we figure out is that um, scaling learning rate and batch size according to the number of GPUs um, improve train performance standing from the, let's say, the statistical efficiency only when large data sets are used, which is not our case, but seems to break down where small data sets are, are used. On the other hand, when we keep the global batch size content and then we, we basically keep also the learning rate constant, this is very promising for, for our application, so for small, small data set, but seems to saturate in the case of, in the case of very large data set, as expected. So we believe that there is not only a strong correlation between batch size and learning rate, but there is also a triangular interaction between batch size, learning rate, and the size of data set, where the optimal stand exactly in this, in this area. Now, uh, the last approach, so the strong, what we call strong scaling, um, as, a, as a limitation, has put an upper bound in terms of parallel workers, but that's motivated by the effect of the box size. Indeed, uh, physically, turbulence case have different skills, and we, do not, we don't have only to learn all of them, but we need to learn the correlation between of them. So as shown there in the plot, enlarging the, the, the training box size led us to have a better generalization capability. 
So combining those two analyses, we were able to match the small scale structure by using our model called TSRGAN, very close to what is, what is uh, achieved by a high fidelity simulation. And we were able to, to match, for example, heat transfer in the case presented here. So that is a case for mate and air flame um, jet. Uh, and this, we believe it's fundamental to, um, to um, in this sense, to uh, drive or to assist the decarbonization path in the future. So our work in conclusion is not only for, let's say, showing the capability of a generative aversion network for turbulent combustion modeling, but is also to provide a kind of user guide when people have to deal with very um, small data set, but very, very large sample. Thank you. Many thanks. Many thanks. It's very complex to block the passion, but uh, many thanks for you. So next. So, yeah, my name is David Brayford, and I'm going to be talking about the uh, Quantex uh, project, which is a collaboration between the iChecker here from Ireland and LRZ from Munich in uh, Germany. So, uh, I am actually a computer scientist, not a physicist. I'm actually going to talk about how we deploy the um, frameworks and the workflows of developed by the uh, physicists and uh, developers at iCheck. And what we uh, initially want to talk about is that all the software is open source. So if you, can, if you go to the poster, look at it, look at the papers we've written, there's, um, you can go to GitHub and download and test the, the source. All the uh, code is written in uh, uh, Julia. And we actually deploy, there's two ways we actually can deploy the software. One is you can build it on a bare metal system, but we also have container recipes for it. And I'm going to uh, explain why we're interested in container uh, Recipes is because it basically allows you to easily uh, migrate your workflows from one HPC center to the next. Because if you're looking at, say, the exascale systems for the, these quantum simulators, we work, want to run it on as big a systems as possible. And these systems are going to be heterogeneous, and they're going to be different at different centers. And so what we want to do is be able to, as easily as possible, migrate those workflows as without making too much changes to it. So if you think, for example, of Lego, right? You want to change a, a, a green block to a red block to a blue block. Think of those as GPUs, right? I want a red GPU, or I want a green GPU, or I want a, a blue GPU. Or I don't have a GPU at all, right? Or I have some other accelerator. I have different types of MPI, etc. So how do we sort of um, do that? So that's what we're looking at containers for doing is actually providing a way to allow uh, the users to quickly to deploy the application, get it running, the, and the workflows on the system, because one of the problems which we see with other um, software pro um, projects is that the developers spend a lot of time helping users get the, applica the application and the workflows running on a system, and they're spending less and less time to actually um, uh, enhance the features of the software. So, and the more and more popular it gets, the more and more people are using it, the more and more time they're doing it. So uh, also we want to talk about um, the successes of the project. So we've had, in the last uh, six months, we've had three papers uh, published. Two were at supercomputing and workshops. Was on, one was in the quantum workshop, one was in the container workshop, and we also had a paper in the uh, open source uh, foundation. All this information will be on the poster. And if, um, also you mentioned we've run it on the Intel Skylake -like, -like system, which is the SuperMook NG system at LRZ, the, basically the flagship system flagship system. We have a small test AMD or a ROM system, and we have an A64 FX, which is basically the Fujitsu chip, and we also had a, ran it on a, a Thunder X2 ARM chip as well. And we were able to actually deploy this inside a container within an hour and get the actual, actually the uh, workflows running and generating data. We were also able to profile the uh, applications either on biometal and with inside the container using liquid. And we've got data from the um, hardware counters, and we've been using that to uh, examine the performance. And the performance in terms of the, uh, the difference between the containers and the, and on the bare metal is pretty much the same. There's a little bit difference, but it can be uh, accounted for by sort of system jitter. Um, so we're basically, we think uh, we're doing really well. And uh, if any questions, please uh, con you know, contact me, and that will be around the poster. Thank you. Many things.
Yeah, my, my name is uh, Badr Kawi. I'm a CNRS Associate Scientist. I'm working at the lab of biomechanics and bioengineering and the city called Compiègne is not far away from uh, Paris. Uh, well, I'm there working, I'm a physicist and I'm working there to develop new tools, uh, numerical tools and uh, computer codes to, to simulate uh, uh, problems in biomedical engineering. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not developing uh, techniques or algorithms in HPC, but I'm rather using HPC uh, to speed up my uh, computer, uh, computer codes. And here we have two examples I'm working on. For example, we are working on problems that are very complicated because uh, it involves multi-physics, uh, different solvers, for example, flow, uh, CFD, computer, uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, mass transfer and uh, fluid structure interaction, especially uh, structures that are deformable, like I'm uh, showing at the right, uh, le uh, right side. Uh, uh, for example, the, uh, squeezing multiple particles that are deformable into constriction, or to the left side we have a drug delivery from particle. We are developing uh, new strategies for an, uh, in nanomedicine. To, to study drug delivery from particles and how they perform under flow. And uh, for this, we are using MPI, Message Passing Interface, for, uh, par par to paralyze the codes, and also CoArray, a Fortran technology. And uh, I'm using a lattice Boltzmann method, immersive boundary method, uh, programmed in Fortran, and that's what I'm uh, doing. And I will be happy to discuss with you. And also, I want to go for for this biomedical engineering, I'm working with experimentalists. They are really demanding because they would like to really simulate uh, real systems, uh, especially in our group. We are working on microfluidic devices, and they want to implement all the features. And this requires to go for, uh, uh, will require large computational domains and also high resolution to solve uh, properly the, the deformation of particles. And the, the only way to solve this is to go to HPC. And uh, at the moment, I'm working uh, running simulations on my local uh, computer cluster and also at the computer center in Ulich. And I'm trying to go, uh, for example, to large uh, scale uh, machines at the national and European level. Many thanks. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to discuss with you more details uh, in fact of my poster. Many thanks for all. Yeah, it's complex for the short time we. We ask, but uh, so Arnaud, the same, is the next. Hi, thank you for having me. So I'm Arnaud Montagut from BSC, and I'm going to present a collaboration between BSC and Institut Curie here in Paris. So this is a collaboration in the project of Permit COE. This is one of the use cases of, of Permit COE. So uh, we have been developing for several years uh, multi-skill tool of simulation in which cells are agents and in each one of the agents we have Boolean models. And this allows us to perturb uh, environment and genetical and genetical uh, perturbations at once. And also this allows us to like open the hood in the cells and see what is not working correctly when in cancer and in other problems. So one of the use cases of, of Permit COE was to apply this to COVID. So what we did is we uh, personalized the models with uh, patients' data. And then the idea was to try to uncover what mechanisms would be different in different uh, patients that have different severities. So for instance, you have there the 41 is mild and the 43 is a severe patient. And uh, so we had some simulations in which you see that there are some differences between these, these patients. And in these simulations, we have different agents that, that uh, correlate with epithelial cells, macrophages, and there's the bird's eye view of the different interactions of the cells. And interestingly, as we are in, this, in the Center of Excellence for HPC, we wanted to launch this in Mare Nostrum 4. And so we divided this workflow into different building blocks that we containerized and that you can, you can plug and play in different pipelines. And then we, we wanted to study the strong scalability and the weak scalability of this, of this workflow. So as we were working with BSC tools such as Extra I and Paraver, we, were, we, we could look at the traces of the different, of the different building blocks. So I identified that one of the building blocks was draining in the weak, in the weak scaling uh, efficiency. So uh, we're currently working on, on, on ameliorating this, um, this building block in order to have a bigger and, and better scalability. So thank you very much. If you have any other question, I will be at the poster uh, answering them.
So many thanks. Just in time. Congratulations. So next is uh, Gischt. Guys, guys, sorry. Yes, sorry for my pronunciation. Eh? Very bad. Hi, yes, my name is Gijs van den Oort. Uh, I'm uh, from the Netherlands eScience Center. Uh, and I present uh, a project we did with um, the University of Delft of Technology, uh, Mohamed Fatih Azavar Kavani and uh, Stefan Hegel. And uh, the uh, subject of this uh, project is um, multi phase uh, chemically reacting turbulent flows. Um, this is a very um, important subject, not only from a fundamental uh, physics perspective, but it has applications in uh, combustion engines and uh, uh, jet propulsion, turbines, uh, industrial applications. So it's a, a pretty hot topic. Um, and um, uh, you see there a, a famous uh, test case, Spray A, uh, where uh, uh, a fuel jet is injected into a, a high pressure chamber and uh, uh, a lot of stuff is happening there. A jet is developing, ignition cores are uh, developing and um, uh, uh, the chemistry solver needs to uh, work hard at specific grid points. Um, so the, the uh, mesh parallelization, uh, which is typically uh, tailored to, uh, to, to optimize for transport, is, uh, is not uh, optimized for, for this uh, unbalanced uh, uh, chemical reactions and uh, um, that poses a, yeah, uh, an efficiency problem. Uh, and we are tackling that with, um, with load balancing, with dynamical load balancing. So, so the, uh, we, we uh, try to, uh, to make the, the compute load more homogeneous by offloading uh, grid points to other processes on the fly. Um, we uh, developed um, uh, very scalable and fast uh, repartitioning algorithms to do this and a, and a, a framework uh, or a library to, uh, to handle this, this offloading of uh, work to, uh, to idle processes and we see a good uh, performance increase uh, at 2.5 uh, across uh, many uh, parallel scales. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you want to know more about this library or this technique, uh, come and see me uh, at the, the poster, I would say. Thanks. Many thanks. Great. So, Claude, please. Welcome. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Claude Talandier, a research engineer in working for CNRS in physical oceanography. Um, so to, to be quick, a few keywords and sentences. Uh, I would say HPC, for sure, numerical simulation. And about physics, it's Arctic Basin and uh, ocean and sea ice small scale features. And those small scale features are, are the teeny things that you can see on the left, uh, we are, which are eddies, small eddies or filaments about 10 kilometers. And this is what we would like to, to understand and how it behaves in the, in the whole Arctic basin. And uh, for that, it's quite challenging. And we are, we, we, I'm going to, to, uh, to expose in the poster uh, our modeling effort in representing such features. And thanks to the price uh, allocation uh, of uh, 35 million CPU hours, uh, we were able to, to perform a, just a six year-long simulation, and on the right side, you can see just a snapshot, uh, a daily mean of the sea ice concentration within the Arctic, it's the Beaufort gyre, and you can see also that we are clearly able to, to, to simulate those small-scale features, so we, we are quite happy for that. And now the, the, the upcoming step is to go into the details and to perform the analysis of the whole data set that we, we have. So. As you can see, I'm in white as the sea ice, so you can catch me at any time if you have questions or you would like to, to talk about more about that. Thank you. Many thanks. Great. So next is uh, Jean. Welcome. Uh, so I'm uh, Jean Alam. I'm a PhD student at uh, Ecole Centrale de Lyon and uh, Safran Aircraft Engines uh, in France. 
and I'm going to present you an overview of my uh, works uh, entitled uh, Fan OGV Broadband Noise Predictions Using uh, Large Eddy Simulations, or LES. So it's well known today that the fan stage of a Niro engine is a main noise contributor to the total emissions, to the total noise emissions of the uh, airplane. And that is especially at approach uh, conditions, so when the airplane is close to the population or it's close to the landing. The main objective of this work is to uh, directly predict three main noise mechanisms uh, schematically presented here in the figure, so the tip gap noise, the rotor stator interaction noise, and the uh, self noise of a uh, fan stage using large ED simulations. For that, LES were performed uh, using AVBP code on, periodic, uh, on a periodic sector on, and on a full stage, uh, 360 degrees, uh, full annulus uh, configuration. So uh, this uh, letter, full uh, stage configuration, is the first of its, of its kind in LES, and it is characterized by an unstructured mesh of 1.5 billion points, and it's now running on a price demand of 30 million uh, CPU hours and on uh, 15,000 uh, CPU, uh, CPU cores. So I finally here for the setup show a mesh view around the rotor and the stator, uh, just to note the uh, main zone uh, mesh uh, refinements and to note that uh, we are uh, doing uh, direct noise predictions from the LES. At the right, you can see the main results. So uh, at, at the right, I begin uh, by showing the uh, periodic sector results. And we can see, uh, for example, by the wave uh, fronts, uh, the main noise sources, so the trailing edge noise, the uh, separation noise that are due to fluctuations in the boundary layers, in the bottom, we can see the, uh, the interactions between the rotor wakes with the stators that generate the rotor-stator interaction noise, for example. We can see also the interaction of the tip leakage flow with the blades that uh, generate the tip leakage noise. At the left, we can see the first results of the full stage configuration that allows us to predict all the cotton acoustic modes in the configuration and to uh, pr well predict the blade-to-blade -blade, uh, correlations. So here we can see the first result, the turbulent structures around the blade rotor. So we have seen, we have studied uh, the, the main uh, noise mechanisms of the of a fan stage, and for the future we are going to continue the computation on the full stage 360 degrees uh, configuration. Thank you. Many things. Many things. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Berto Scianti from uh, Fondazione Lynx, and um, to, today I will uh, uh, share with you some aspects uh, regarding the ACROSS project that we are coordinating. Um, in the ACROSS project, uh, we address the challenges of uh, basically to uh, support the execution of uh, what we call the cross-tech uh, workflows, so uh, basically um, workflows that mix uh, uh, traditional numerical simulations with uh, uh, HPDA, um, uh, machine learning, deep learning tasks, and that of uh, uh, basically uh, improving the energy efficiency of the uh, entire execution uh, platform, uh, basically to by leveraging as much as possible on uh, hardware acceleration. Um, to this end, basically we uh, started to uh, design and implement uh, um, uh, a multi-layered uh, orchestration system. Uh, which allows us to um, basically to define and model the, the workflows and match uh, uh, their steps with the most suitable execution environment. Uh, allows us to uh, on demand uh, acquire uh, basically the uh, execution resources and to have uh, basically a fine grained control of their, uh, the acquired resources. Um, concerning the uh, hardware heterogeneity we are exploring, well, we decided to uh, include a, a different architecture, um, basically including uh, uh, traditional FPGAs, uh, GPUs, uh, but also try to uh, integrate a uh, uh, dedicated toolchain for uh, supporting execution of uh, on uh, uh, basically uh, neuromorphic uh, devices. Um, and well, uh, to try to assess uh, all these uh, uh, innovative things, uh, 
we, uh, we plan it to, uh, to execute uh, different workloads uh, coming from uh, uh, different uh, uh, scientific and uh, uh, industrial domains, including aeronautics, uh, um, energy and carbon sequestration, and the climate and um, uh, weather predictions. So, thank you. Just in time, great, <laughs> many thanks. So it's uh, Michele. Welcome on stage. Uh, my name is Michele Mertone from the Leibniz Supercomputing Center in uh, near Munich, Germany. In HPC, solving linear sparse linear systems is a recurring problem, and it takes a sizable amount of compute time. One one of the approaches for, for solving sparse linear systems, often arising from partial differential equation discretized, is that of multiplying repeatedly the sparse matrix uh, of the problem by one vector or maybe a few of them, so a skinny, dense matrix. Um, this sort of operations is called sparse blas operations. And this is the way we refer to this kind of libraries. So BLAS means basic linear algebra operations like the sparse matrix um, multiplication then up on the left. Um, one of those libraries is called libRSB where it takes the name from recursive sparse block which is the data structure that subdivides a given matrix in a way to make it closer to cache memories and the computing cores for performance reasons. And this is a very feature rich and sophisticated library. And this is what, well, my poster and my work is about. Um, the idea is to, to support a wide range of operations, but mostly for authors of um, iterative methods for solving sparse systems. And what I said about the data structures is just internals because in the end, at the end of the day, for the user, what matters is just using um, the given one of the many um, interface languages, which it works, and on any imaginable CPU and on many operating systems. So. Uh, you're welcome to ask me more or ask me about the project, which is a praise funded at the poster. Thank you. So many thanks. So now it's uh, Alejandro. Uh, I, I'm sorry because I, I think I will push too much to, to enter in the two minutes. I'll be brief. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so many thanks. So hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Alejandro, I'm a finishing PhD student at the University of Vienna. And what we do is uh, apply quantum chemistry methods that have been um, originally and traditionally um, successfully applied to molecular systems to solid state systems. So um, we are physicists and we're working on that. And um, I wanted to present here that many of these many body correlated methods that are being used in, 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 this, in these scenarios are very much alike to uh, tensor networks. So I'll be presenting some of the libraries that we are using and also developing in order to um, uh, compute these massive parallel uh, problems on, on supercomputers in a quite automated fashion. And also um, um, to see where also these uh, automated uh, libraries kind of uh, are not anymore applicable. And uh, I'll be presenting also another library um, that I wrote um, to, to compute a very successful uh, theory in quantum chemistry without, without this, this sense of framework. So if you're interested in knowing how uh, quantum chemists uh, use tensors and tensor networks, 
and how this is applicable to solids. So just come to my poster and we can have a chat. So thank you very much. Many thanks. So it's, uh, next is uh, Petro. You're welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Petro Strakos, and I am from uh, IT4 Innovations, which is uh, Czech National Supercomputing Center. And what I would like to present is the uh, outcome of uh, uh, cooperation which uh, we have with uh, medical uh, doctors at uh, Faculty Hospital in our uh, region. And basically the main goal of this cooperation is uh, to provide the doctors uh, with uh, uh, full 3D tissue reconstructions uh, that uh, they can then use to better prepare, for example, for the surgeries. Uh, we cooperate specifically with uh, uh, doctors that uh, focus on uh, liver cancer surgeries. And uh, to allow all of this, uh, basically it was necessary to build kind of platform uh, within which uh, we can quickly provide automatic segmentation of specific tissues uh, for the doctors. And not only this, uh, it is also possible to then uh, validate the data and uh, send them back uh, for further uh, development of uh, deep learning based uh, models and also do uh, further research on, uh, on those models. Uh, in case you want to uh, know more details about this topic, please uh, come to our poster. Thank you. Many thanks. So next is uh, George. You're welcome. Hello, good morning. My name is Jorge Barbosa from University of Porto. Uh, I, uh, this work that I'm going to present is uh, um, a collaboration with a company from Belgium, the QB, that they have um, a simulator for quantum computing. Uh, the, main, the main idea is to be able to scale the, the simulator so that they, they can uh, address uh, higher problems. The problem can be easily stated by tensor mathematics, but uh, this, will, uh, 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 this will consume a lot of memory and also would be a very C CPU intensive uh, computation. Uh, we uh, uh, follow another approach that is to represent the state based uh, uh, the old states and keep track uh, uh, of uh, uh, the, the update of the states as the quantum operations are performed. Uh, uh, each, each state uh, needs to, uh, is represented by a complex number that is the probability of being uh, the system in that state. Uh, this is also, uh, anyway, we, we can even for 40 qubits, we can, uh, may need 100 uh, terabytes, for example, of memory. And the, the, um, the, the challenge is, in fact, to have a distributed solution so, so that we can, we can keep track of all the, uh, those states and uh, perform the, the quantum operations as the algorithm requires. And uh, in the slide there is uh, just a simple example with four states. And uh, if uh, a qubit changes the, their state or one operation affects one qubit, we have to track and update all the, the positions of the, state, of the space uh, to, uh, to obtain a correct, a correct uh, update. Okay, thank you. Many thanks. Great. So next is uh, Hendrik. So I'm really sorry to press people. Huh? In fact, two minutes is a complex exercise. Hi, I'm Many Hendrik Jung. I'm doing a PhD at the Max Planck Institute of Biophysics in the theoretical department, and we designed an AI algorithm to enhance the sampling and understanding of complex molecular transitions. Um, we applied it to the dissociation and assembly of the MGA2 uh, transmembrane dimer, which you can see here. It has a dissociation constant of roughly one per second. And uh, reaching the second time scale with traditional equilibrium molecular dynamics would take uh, a wall time of roughly 100 years for this system. 
and then we would have seen only one dissociation. This is obviously impractical, but um, our AI was able to collect an unbiased ensemble of transition paths in 20 days of wall time, and it collected 4,000 transitions. By observing so many transitions, the AI was able to statistically infer the key degrees of freedom that control the transition and discovered two distinct reaction channels that we didn't know of previously. And um, by steering and controlling multiple molecular dynamic simulations at the same time, the AI is able to circumvent the internode communication bottleneck and therefore scales very well to large HPC systems. And in addition, the by Steering, analyzing the MD simulation autonomously, it frees me and other researchers from uh, tedious tasks like setting up the simulations and we can engage in more creative and rewarding tasks like actual understanding of the transition dynamics. Great, many thanks. <laughs> so next is uh, Andish. Welcome on stage. Hello, I'm Andrzej Metza and I'm developer of a highly parallel uh, numerical solver that is able to fully utilize the modern supercomputer. But uh, we really had the problem with uh, loading and storing the input because our input is uh, usually unstructured mesh. And as you can see, unstructured meshes can be really complex and it was the reason why we developed the uh, Messio tool. This tool is uh, it, it contains algorithm for highly parallel loading of uh, unstructured mesh databases from standard pro preprocessing tools like ANSYS, GMesh, and so on, but, only, but also from NSIDE, VTK, uh, and uh, XDMF that is important in the case of restarting the computation from, from previous unfinished run. With uh, our tool, we are able to load uh, the mesh with uh, hundreds of millions of el elements in several seconds. And uh, what is really important is that we are independent from any particle data arrangement within the database. It means that we are able to uh, use the same database uh, for sequential run or for run on uh, one node on, uh, or uh, on the run with uh, thousands of nodes. And if we compare the run times uh, between different kinds of databases. The runtime for loading is almost the same. So if you want to know more, please come to my poster. I'm, I think that this tool is really interesting for anybody that use, that, that work uh, with unstructured, unstructured meshes. Thank you. Many thanks, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, I am Sri Ram Krishnan Murali Krishnan, uh, postdoctoral fellow from Paul Scherer Institute. Uh, so, uh, kinetic plasma simulations are important for many applications such as uh, nuclear fusion, particle physics, astrophysics, and particle accelerators. Uh, going towards exascale, it is evident that uh, we have to deal with heterogeneous architectures with GPUs and CPUs from different vendors. So the goal of the Alpine project is to create a set of performance portable plasma physics mini apps uh, with these so-called particle in cell schemes, which are currently the workhorse for these type of simulations uh, targeting exascale architectures. Uh, so these mini apps are really set of lightweight codes, uh, which you can use as a sandbox for testing new algorithms, new HPC implementations, uh, before moving on to production codes. So in that sense, it uh, serves as an interface between applied mathematics, computer science, to applications. Um, so far, we have uh, these uh, three mini apps, Landau Damping, Penning Trap, and Two Stream Instability, which are uh, usually used in electrostatic plasma simulations. Uh, on the bottom right, you can see uh, the performance of one of these mini apps, linear Landau Damping, um, on these Phi architectures. Uh, Pistained uh, CPU and GPU partitions at uh, CSES, uh, Cori KNL nodes from Berkeley, uh, Perlmutter uh, A100 GPUs from NERSC, and Summit V100 GPUs from Oak Ridge. Uh, so the solid lines are for 1 billion particles, and the dashed lines are for 8 billion particles. Uh, 
From this figure, you can see three things. We have performance portability, good scaling on all these architectures, and finally, with latest architectures like the A100 GPU, we get an order of magnitude speed up compared to older architectures like the P100 GPUs. Uh, going forward, we are going to enrich this mini app collection with uh, collisions, electromagnetic, and so on. We will test for more architectures and so on. If you are interested, please visit our poster. Thank you. Many things. Great. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Matej Spetko. I'm from IP4 Innovations. And with my colleagues, we developed an uh, automatized workflow for uh, parallel application analysis and tuning for uh, energy savings. Uh, not only we can uh, do a static configuration of the hardware, but we also provide a dynamic tuning that means uh, as the application goes through different regions, which are, for example, compute bound or memory bound, the workflow can find the best uh, settings for these regions and can change the hardware configuration over time, over the runtime of the application. Uh, this means that with this approach, we can uh, save uh, 10, 30% of the energy, depending on the application. Uh, we support uh, multiple platforms, uh, Intel, AMD, OpenPower, and NVIDIA, and uh, also different uh, measure, measuring systems. Uh, we also provide uh, radar, which is a tool that uh, can show this application dynamism. And we also provide a continuous uh, performance benchmarking tool, which, uh, which uh, uh, can uh, uh, show the application dynamism throughout the application development. Uh, come to see our poster for more information. Thank you. Many thanks, thank you. So next is uh, Tom. So welcome on stage. So hi, I'm, I'm Tom. I'm from the Exoscience Life Lab in uh, Leuven in Belgium. And we help pharmaceutical companies there with their uh, high performance computing problems. And a while ago, we did a project with uh, several pharmaceutical companies on compound activity prediction. In compound activity prediction, you want to predict whether a chemical compound binds with a protein in your body. It's a machine learning problem, and we developed a framework based on matrix factorization, which gave, gave very good prediction, but was very hyper, uh, required a lot of computation. So that's why they, the high performance computing comes in. And we took this application, this compound activity prediction application, and we combined it in the EPIC project with other applications and with programming models like the OMPS programming model from BSC or the GASPI GPI programming model from Fraunhofer. And in this EPIC project, we looked at the trade-off between productivity and performance. And um, the, the, the EPIC project is almost finished. This is, these are the last few days about uh, of the project, and we came to quite some interesting findings in this space but between trade-off performance and productivity. And if you want to learn about these trade-offs, please come to my poster. Thank you. So many things. Great. So we, we arrived to the two last, eh? stay until the end. So next is uh, Oscar. Welcome on stage. So, hi everyone, my name is Oscar Amaro, I'm a PhD student from the group of lasers and plasmas uh, in Lisbon, Portugal, working under the supervision of Dr. Mari Vranic. And today I'm going to talk a bit about our latest work on reduced model to accelerate the study of laser electron scattering. So, near future laser facilities, of better what kind, will reach sufficient intensities such that we'll see creation of electron-positron pairs from photon 
laser collisions. And usually standard um, in these experiments, um, some parameters may vary a lot between shots. And this basically invalidates uh, standard simulation support uh, to these experiments where um, these simulations can take up on the order of a million CPU hours. Uh, in the analytical point of view, uh, the plane wave model, uh, which is usually used, um, is not good enough for uh, focused laser scattering. And so we propose this reduced model. Uh, on the right uh, top corner, you can see a rough sketch of what these collisions look like. So we have a rel relativistic electron beam with some density profile and a focused laser. Each electron will collide with the peak of the laser at some distance from the focus, and therefore different electrons will collide with different intensities. And so one of the main contributions of our work is to derive explicitly uh, the distribution of electrons in intensity. And with this, we can generalize uh, analytical models that were previously derived for a plane wave to more general setups. And this allows us to save uh, a lot of computational resources, basically uh, taking us to real-time uh, modeling of these experiments. Uh, if you want to know more about this work, you can uh, check out our paper uh, in New Journal of Physics, and you can also go by our poster during the lunch break. Thank you very much. Yeah, many thanks. Just in time. So, Lux, uh, the last, Alex, to close the session and come back on stage on this side. Great. Uh, thanks everyone for staying, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so my name is Alex Upton from CSCS, the Swiss National Supercomputing Center. And I'm gonna briefly talk about our poster, that's about Work Package 8 of Brace 6 IP. So Work Package 8 started in May 2019 with the objective of delivering high quality software that addresses the challenges of the rapidly changing Brace scale landscape. And the main outcome of the Work Package is open source software in the form of libraries or significantly refactored codes. In order to attract and support the highest quality of software development, a competitive peer review selection process was run across two calls, resulting in the selection of 10 projects that work independently and presented comprehensive work plans from the beginning. And in fact, two of these projects have already been presented in this session, Lynx and QuantX. In terms of the progress to date, all of the projects have delivered at a public software releases. Uh, these can be found on GitHub or GitLab. And with a view to quality, all of the projects incorporate industry standard tools, such as issue tracking, continuous integration, validation, and verification. In addition, the projects have also achieved encouraging results across a number of the leading European HPC systems. Uh, some of these are detailed explicitly in the poster and include deployment at scale on a number of the um, price zero, zero machines, and also the Euro HPC machines, including the LumiC CPU partition. And finally, to finish, it should also be mentioned that the work in Work Package 8 is synergistic and complementary to the work of the Centers of Excellence. So certain domains that are not present in the Centers of Excellence, such as plasma physics, are present in Work Package 8, whilst a number of the Work Package 8 projects have received strong letters of support from the Centers of Excellence. So thank you for listening, and if you'd like to know more, Please come and find me. Thanks. So many thanks, many thanks in our yeah, clubs all everybody, please. Yeah, because uh, everybody has uh, around one hour to explain his project. Uh, you have only two minutes, so it's very complex. Um, very, very positive because, uh, yeah, during the discussion we had the, the point of uh, international with the uh, user feedback, the user of HPC, what we are building in Europe. Uh, so, yeah, many thanks. Uh, ju just, uh, I will make a personal comment uh, just for next year. Uh, it will be great to have uh, more women on stage. Um, I don't like this, but... Uh, Let's manage it, and, uh, and next year it will be in this way. So many thanks for all. And uh, yeah, take time to visit them, to visit their poster, and to ask them. It's a, it's a very important work they've done, so congratulations.
Many thanks.